Michael Jackson's Thriller Album. Stories in the Room. This is Michael Jackson's Thriller Album, Stories in the Room. Join film composer Anthony Marinelli, who programmed synthesizers for seven songs on Thriller, and a and veteran film producer Stephen Ray, who assisted Quincy Jones and was in the studio every day with Quincy and Michael. Michael Jackson's Thriller Album, Stories in the Room. I'm Anthony Marinelli with my longtime close friend and co-host, Stephen Ray, bringing you the real stories directly from the talented people in the room with us during the making of Thriller, the greatest selling album of all time. We're fortunate to welcome and share stories with recording artist and one of the most prolific guitarists of our time, Paul Jackson Jr. He's performed with the biggest stars in music history, and he's known as the guitarist that can play anything. His memorable work on the Thriller album can be heard on the songs PYT, Beat It, and The Lady in My Life. In this episode, Paul discusses his first instruments, including drums, the importance of having a variety of guitar options, and how Quincy and Bruce would orchestrate his multiple parts. He'll even demonstrate a few licks for us. Well, you know what? That that totally segues into Michael and Quincy because Michael and Quincy apparently, and who knows how they did it? They did it because they were who they are. But they always found the parts and the melodies and the songs because they had to search for all that stuff. They didn't even have the songs. But always the things that move the needle. They knew. And then everything mm-hmm. could come down from that. Because like you're saying, without the key, you know, like Lamont Dozier eight bars... Nobody wants to eat that chicken. Right. 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 And, you know, and to, and to that point, uh, flavor is the word because, you know, no matter what songs you're, you're, you're writing, you know, you were the flavor that, that on so many things that you mm-hmm. touched, you know, with Michael and Quincy, you know, you know, in, you know, in, in, in Dugu on drums, on beaded, that's flavor, that, that flavor and hump. That he well, that was Jeff. That song. That was Jeff on Beat It, right? You're talking about Billy Billy Jean. Billy Jean was in Dugu. Billy Jean, sorry, I'm sorry. Jeff was right. Beat It. Yeah, Jeff was sorry. I'm, I'm Billy. I know, I'm I know what you Billie meant. Because I remember. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Quincy wanting wanting a different kind of hump. He didn't, you know, he had used Jr. on previous records, John Robinson, uh, and you know, of course, Jeff Beccaro on on, on Beat It. But he wanted on on Billy Jean. He wanted that different kind of a, that different flavor, you know. Anthony, you the flavor you added on Thriller, you know, and the sound, you know, all those little little nuances of 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 of, of seasoning, as Paul would say, you know. Well, he brought film guys in. Like I was a film guy coming in on, you know. But you know, funny that I got my first gig ever when I was fifteen that my mom drove me to was with Lamont Dozier at Studio Masters on Sunset with John. I was programming for John Barnes, the great. And I learned from those guys. But yeah, that's, they were like right to the point. You know, it was a pretty amazing experience. You know, you said something funny, Anthony, is that your mom drove you. My mom drove me to my first sessions. How old were you? Uh, uh, the first session did, I was, uh, I was 16. And, uh, and uh, what happened was we had the biggest <laughs> van that Chevy made. And so I would load all my equipment in and she'd drive me to the session and drop me off. And uh, I'd, you know, unload my gear and I'd play and then she'd pick me up later. So yeah, I had the biggest van that Chevy made. And so my mom was my, my, my chef, my chaperone and my cartridge company at the same time. So. Wow. You know, I saw in one of your videos, you almost became a drummer, right? You said you almost bought a drum. Yeah. Set, so you could have been schlepping drums at least. You- right. Exactly. Yeah. She had the foresight not to buy them. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't want, she was thinking ahead of, on the cartridge. She knew you were going to, she was going to be your cartridge person. <laughs> oh man. Well, true, true story is Gardena Valley music on Redondo Beach Boulevard, just west of Vermont, on the south side of the street. I remember it, you know, is in the window, there was a blue metal flake drum set. And it was $369. And my mom said, that is not going to happen. So we went in the store and she said, is there anything else in here that you see you like? And there was a $20 guitar hanging up. And the rest is history. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. True story. Yeah, I was gonna. 
Yeah. And what was your first guitar? Like, what was the first guitar you thought, oh, wow, this is really cool. What, what brand was it? It was a Guild Starfire. And I think I, st I still have it. It's around somewhere. I think it's at my Carter's company, but it was a Guild Starfire. What did you bring to the Thriller sessions? Did you bring a ton of guitars or just like for, for the flavor? I brought a ton of guitars. Okay. I brought a ton of guitars. I brought a Les Paul and I brought this. Okay. Now. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's pretty beautiful. Yeah. I brought this. Yep. Um, this is a Valley Arts, a custom Valley Arts guitar. Valley Arts. It was Arts. made in, I actually have two of them. I have a matched pair of them. Uh, it was made in 1981 by Mike McGuire at Valley Arts Guitar Center in uh, Studio City. Ventura Boulevard, yep. And Ventura Boulevard, yep, absolutely. And at that time, he was making guitars for, you know, like all the session guys. And so I went and said, I, you know, I want you to make me one of those, you know, guitars that you make. He said, what do you want? I said, give me the best of everything. <laughs> So it's a matched rosewood body. It's a bird's eye maple neck. It's an ebony fingerboard. And at the time, there was a company called Bartolini that was coming out with uh, Stratocaster pickups that didn't hum. They didn't buzz like other pickups. So we put those in, and that has a lot to do with the sound of the guitar. You know, everything, the, the wood, the neck, everything. But uh, that's the guitar I brought, and I still use it. It doesn't really get out of the house much, but I use it a lot on sessions here at home. Is that what you used on thr on the Thriller album? Or did you use different ones for different songs? Well, I used this one on PYT. On Lady in My Life, I used a, a Gibson 335. And for the distorted part on PYT, I used a Les Paul. And on Beat It, I think I used a Les Paul as well. So you're switching up, but you brought everything just to cover. You brought a lot of stuff to cover, like, you know, ideas, right? Whatever. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, back yeah, back in the day you had to, you know, you, as part of your job was you didn't know what you were going to expect, so you bring as much stuff that may cover what might come up. Oh, I had the whole I had every hallway filled with cases. I mean, I I didn't know what I I just wanted I wanted to be prepared and I didn't want to get kicked out. That's what I was thinking coming in. We yeah. had so much stuff. <laughs> um so well, can you between you and Michael between you and Michael Boddicker, it looked like a synthesizer convention. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of stuff. And, and we had computer. We brought that in big... the hallway in the back. And we had that big computer in B just set up, the Synclavier back back then. It was it was it it didn't have sampling, but it was just a FM synthesizer. But to get that, we still had to have a big mainframe sit in there, make a noise, you know, and had to deal with that and everything. Um, so you I remember when George got his... George I remember Duke. when George got his Sinclair and Duke, and same thing, like you said, he had big bays of computers and drives and all this stuff. And and I remember it was a major deal. You know, he had to redesign his control room around the Sinclair. Well, air condition HVAC. You have to have it. We have to have dedicated system for it, and and to shut it up too. It's so noisy. Um, so you played a lick earlier. Can you play that so we could hear that? Um, the PYT lick. I Absolutely. I absolutely can. It's the, the, um, Stephen Ant and I were talking earlier and the fact is, let me see if I can tilt this down just a little bit. I just want to hear it again. Yeah. Is that this is, this is a song that gets revisited a lot actually, which is, um, I mean, after all these years, but the famous intro. Yes. Yeah. you know so yeah that's the famous you know the, the intro lick but it's the kind of that simple kind of stuff it finds a it finds a place there's like a slot for it and you're able to come up with that you know because everything speaks it's like an orchestration i mean a lot of that that album is so well orchestrated in terms of technical and classical approach to orchestration and also the way it's mixed you know it's designed for because we had the advantage of faders that you don't have in an orchestra but i noticed the way that the musicians played was it just like everybody jamming and all and then it sorted out later you know mm -hmm. what, what was happening were you guys just it just came out or did you, how like who went first to get that group was it the bass 
Because uh, I'm go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The last thing I think the bass was there's like um, a synth bass on it too in the end. So how do you remember how it all just sort of sequenced down? Well, the original tracking date obviously there was a synth bass, but by the time I got to do the overdubs, there was synth bass. Uh, you know, along with the along with Lewis's part. Uh, so I imagine they took the basic track and then started building on it. And my session was obviously one of the building blocks. Funny thing, you talk about orchestrating the parts. Most of the song, the guitar part, is the second part I put down, not the first part. The okay. first part, Bruce and Quincy brought in toward the fade. There's a lick that goes like... Uh, it's a lick that goes like that. Let me show you here. Uh, that was actually on the first part, but he didn't bring the first part in till the second, till till later in the song. What the most of the song is actually the second guitar part I put down. Right. So, uh, but so, so he would orchestrate. He'd bring things in, bring things in and out, you know. Uh, and like you said, it was very, very well orchestrated, and it wasn't just you know jamming. It was like, okay, let's do this, line this up here, and it's like, and then let's fit in the pieces of the puzzle to make sure that you know everything, nothing's stepping on anything, and everything is complementing everything. Yeah. Again, so was, like was, a lot like a film. Just that's how film scores. They're just so far ahead in doing an album like that. Yeah. And stepping back and then digging out these parts and then switching them around. Join us for the next episode of Michael Jackson's Thriller album, Stories in the Room, with your hosts, Anthony Marinelli and Stephen Ray. Watch our extended interviews on youtube.com forward slash at Stories in the Room. Audio only interviews are available on all podcast networks. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Stories in the Room. For the latest news and links, visit the website, storiesintheroom.com. This podcast is produced by Christian D. Brune and David Wolf, recorded by Autovita Studios. Additional recording by Ben Rackless, edited by Sean Hedinger. Music by Anthony Marinelli and Stephen Ray. Michael Jackson's doing